Welcome to the Jay and Rob Toy Show. I'm your host, Rob McCallum, and boy, it is a wonderful day in the toy aisles today. But you're not just here with me, you're with my good friend, the Joker to my Batman, Mr. Jay Bartlett. Jay, how are you doing today? Oh, I am so good, mate, and I'm glad you called me Joker. Which one, though? Heath Ledger or Mark Hamill? Hmm. I'll have to get back to you. Neither, my friend. You are Cesar Romero all, all the way, painting the mustache. It, that's just you to a T. <laughs> that's how I see you. I'm, I'm sorry. It's just how it is. Uh, and speaking of variations and versions, we have a very big topic today, something that is in all circles of collecting, and that is the discussion of holy grails. Now, I, I don't even know where to, to dig into this, but I want to make sure you're ready, because once we head down this path, Jay, there's no turning back. There is no turning back. I'm ready. Uh, this is something that we often talk about. I'm just, I'm eager to dive in. Let's do it. All right, holy grails it is. We got to start at the beginning, and that, of course, is definitions. How do you even begin to define what a holy grail is? Where do you start? Where does your head specifically go, go Jay, when someone says, Oh, you know, that's one of the holy grails. And what, what are you thinking off the cuff? Well, obviously something that's extremely rare, something that is very uncommon that you don't see in most people's collection. It could be a prototype, it could be a short printed figure, vehicle or play set. Anything that you can't normally find on eBay, I think would qualify as a grail as well. Something that you search and uh, doesn't necessarily always pop up. Something that when you do see it and you do have a chance to purchase it, you better take that chance because you might not again for another decade or so. That's an interesting uh, way to approach it, the opportunity in which you might have uh, the chance to acquire it. I really like also what you said about eBay. If it's not on eBay, my goodness, that tells you something about how available these things are. I want to go one step further to your definition. I want to say that something that's a holy grail is something that transcends just one line of collector. So you might be a Star Wars fan or a Ninja Turtles fan, but chances are if an item is truly a holy grail, if you're a figure collector, regardless of the line that it's from, you've probably heard of it. So if you're into Turtles, you might still have heard of Wonder Bread He-Man. Or if you're into Star Wars, you might have heard of Scratch from TMNT. It's the kind of figures that just everybody knows about because they've been around for so long and the story attached to them, another key point, the story attached to these figures just becomes legend on its own. Absolutely, the story is so important as we saw in Nintendo Quest with such, uh, you know, gems as stadium events. That game's not necessarily the greatest, but the story attached to it, I still think is one of our favorites in video game history. So the story, the story makes the piece, really, it does. Yeah, and it's often this interesting thing where the thing that makes it rare, the thing that makes it a holy grail is never by design. It's not like the early 90s of collecting, be it toys or comic books that say, collector's edition and you better get it now. There's always some weird factory goof or something that happens in history that causes the object, whether it's something like stadium events for video game collectors or something like Blue Snaggletooth for action figure collectors, there's something that, that causes it to go an offshoot and fall between the cracks, don't you think? Absolutely, a lot of times as well, it's when something is coming towards the end of the run, like a lot of the, the later master stuff is, is the rarest out of the bunch, stuff like that. So when popularity kind of dwindles down for a line, those later released figures like video games of that console generation are very sought after. Now it's interesting, there's a few things I wanna to touch on. You, you've mentioned that grails are those uncommon, almost impossible things to find. Right away I'm thinking, okay, all the items for action figures gotta fit into a category and you and I talk about common, uncommon, um, you know, rare, and then holy grail? Or is there something in between? Like how many of these different categories are there when we're talking about a figure and the ability to, to get one? Myself, I would really only count maybe three, just to make it a little bit more simplistic. I think obviously common is common. There's rare stuff. Now rare by definition, I would say, would be stuff that was available to the mass public. And uh, you see once in a while on eBay, not all the time, but if you keep searching, I'd, I'd think for a month period, you'd eventually come across it. Whether you want to pay those prices or not is up to you. 
And then of course the Holy Grail is uh, perhaps prototype, something that was released later in the run, or of course something like the blank from the Playmates Dick Tracy line. No, those would be the three categories that I personally would go by. Now it's interesting because a couple times now, both yourself and me have done this thing where we've pluralized the term Holy Grail. It's actually Holy Grails. But how can that be? Because when we're talking about the Holy Grail, we're of course talking about, you know, the, the Arthurian legend, the actual grail itself sure. as, as tied to, you know, Jesus Christ as seen in Last Crusade with Indiana Jones. He's in search of the one and only Holy Grail. But collectors often say, oh, that's one of the grails. So how can you have one but many and how holy of a grail is it if there are so many? I don't know how deep you want to get into this. There was only one Jesus Christ, therefore there's only one cup, right? But as far as collecting, there are so many different lines and different collectors collect different lines. Unlike me, the maniac, I collect all the lines. Usually most collectors limit themselves and that's a good thing. So the grail is within their line that they're collecting. Does every line looking back at them have a grail unto itself? Or is it really just a handful of figures that are worthy of that title? I don't know off the top of my head if I would say all lines have holy grail figures. All lines certainly have uncommon figures, figures in the line that are a little bit more difficult to find perhaps. But yeah, I wouldn't say that all lines have holy grails. You know, something like Masters of the Universe, the Attorney of Playset is considered one of those must-have, almost Holy Grail-like pieces. Now, it's not a figure. It's not super easy to come by. It's pricey, but they're out there. I don't know if I would consider something like Eternia a Holy Grail. It might be a personal Holy Grail that you want for your collection, but I don't know that I'd bestow Holy Grail status on something like Eternia. What do you think in that case? I absolutely would. I would hold Eternia up there. There's 4,000 pieces that were produced for that playset. And as we've seen in the first season of Action Figure Adventure, that playset is very fragile. The, uh, the tracks for the little cars are brittle and over time that stuff just doesn't hold up. You have to be very careful. So not only is it difficult to find but to find one that's intact with all its pieces, that's another thing we need to cover. Does it have all the pieces? Because that's very important. Accessories are, are totally important. I guess I just have such a hard time with something like Eternia because even though there's reportedly only 4,000 pieces, uh, product SKUs out there uh, from later in the Masters run, and of course it was a very, expi uh, very expensive item when it came out, I, I just still feel like it, like there's no story that goes along with it other than it getting pulled off the shelf late and didn't sell well. It, it's not like a blue snag or it's not like an Anakin from Power of the Force, right? Like those are region specific things that didn't sell well on top of that. Sure. Like it just doesn't feel like it has enough boxes checked. Yeah, for me, The Legend of Eternia, it's something we've always talked about where the sheer size of that playset is something that most collectors talk about. You know, you talk about size, obviously the first thing that comes to your mind is the G.I. Joe USS flag. I would say Eternia is a close second to that as far as the sheer scale of that playset. It's almost three in one, but that in itself to me is a good enough story. Yeah, the flag is another interesting one, right? Because it's a big piece, it's sought after, it wasn't around for a long time, but it was still out there. And it had a lot of notoriety even back then, as much as it does today with the real American hero collectors. Yeah. Is the flag a grail just because of the scale and the size? Because, you know, we saw more than one or two in our travels for action figure adventures, so I don't feel like it was that hard to come across. You bring up another good point, and I think there's another category we haven't talked about yet, and that's prestige. Having the USS flag in your collection, uh, the Joe collectors call it being a part of the Admirals Club. So I think it's almost like an accomplishment or an achievement. Now to find the USS flag, which has 151 pieces total, to find that complete, I would say is nearly impossible. You can piece it together, you know how people buy old cars and that's kind of their retirement. They put together their 67 Corvette or whatever throughout the years. You could do that with the flag, but to find it complete is very, very rare. So again, prestige is another thing when we're talking about Holy Grails. We're also talking uh, external versus internal. And what I mean by that is I might have a personal Holy Grail that somebody else doesn't even care about. I could pick an obscure line 
you know, a, whatever, maybe something like Supernaturals and say, oh, the playset for that is my holy grail. Well, that's great. And it might be rare and it might be hard to come across and it might check so many of, bo so many of the boxes. But by and large, not a lot of people are diehard Supernaturals fans compared to, say, Masters or Joe or Turtles. Sure, yeah. So I think there's a dichotomy, of course, between personal grails and a widely held uh, holy grails that the public says, yeah, that's a holy grail. Do you? What are, what are the differences for you? Where do you draw that line between personal and, and widely held? No, I totally agree with you there. Uh, personally, in my collection, I have a few of those. One would be Tommy Rashikagi from the 2006 G.I. Joe number 26 comic pack. And that is basically the origin of Snake Eyes and Storm Shadow. This is a three pack, like I said, came out in 2006. It's up there in value. It's not something a lot of people know about outside of the hardcore Joe community. They're in the case right behind me and they hold a special place in my heart. They're hard to get, but if you were to talk to a Transformers fan, a Star Wars fan, they might not even know what that is. So this is the door to the museum, and now it's open. Welcome to Rancho Obi-Wan. And this is it, right up front, the Tower of Power, the Tower of Action figures, with every Kenner action figure released between 1978 and 1986, all the vintage action figures on cards. Wow. And they're guarded by uh, 575 uh, Hasbro Stormtroopers. As I mentioned, foreign action figures, so we have a, uh, uh, an action figure on the square card from Meccano in France. Here's an action figure packaged in the Colgate Dental Cream uh, uh, package from Spain. Unfortunately, it's the, uh, it's the character with the worst teeth in Star Wars, Bib Fortuna. That's not a very good ad for Colgate Dental Cream. <laughs> well, maybe they're trying to say, don't end up like this guy. He's maybe. A he's a reminder to brush every day. Maybe. And over here, we've got uh, vinyl figures, including uh, some early prototypes, sculpts from... Uh, the TV series Clone Wars and Rebels. Skywalker Ranch wine, always part of a collection. Becoming vintage quickly. <laughs> Yo, know, actually, we should drink some of this stuff. We have two games that were never released. Revenge of the Jedi. Oh, of course. Robot Chicken. These are uh, stop motion figures from all three of the Star Wars specials that they did. The Emperor, Obi-Wan, and uh, Nerd Boy. So that's incredible. Darth Vader goes fishing. Well, because I remember that scene. Oh, uh, yeah, it was clearly in uh, Return that, of the Empire. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. This is a prototype Bantha hand puppet from 1995 that Hasbro showed to Lucasfilm and then decided not to make. Here's one I had made for Star Wars Celebration. Oh, wow. <laughs> Rice Snacks from 1978, Star Wars Knife Rack, Cream of Jawa Soup, Ladies Shoes, Dubak Cigarettes, an R2-D2 Vacuum. Like a Roomba. This is the original Toys R Us display from 1995 when Hasbro, which then owned Kenner, came back with action figures for the first time. And they were bulky action figures. You can see the Luke Skywalker he-Man Luke, this uh, the Moss Eisley Space Port, and Jed IPA, Imperial Stout Trooper. I notice a lot of these are empty. Some of them are empty. <laughs> oh, so you went to Galaxy's Edge. I went to Galaxy's Edge, it's great, I love it. Day one? No, uh, actually the day before it opened, they had uh, some availabilities for four hours and Steve's rule number two know people who know people you know the trash compactor and the Dianoga uh-huh well we always wondered how the Dianoga got trapped on the Death Star it was in a barrel of hazardous waste Where do you find something like this? <laughs> you get it made. <laughs>
Well, Jay, there's that familiar sound that's going to be everybody's ringtone, and that means it's time for Action Figure Spotlight. Now, we're talking holy grails, and we've chosen, despite having a couple between you and I, to focus on three figures each that we would like to have in our collection. So what is the first holy grail that you would like to one day see on one of your shelves? In my opinion, this is one I haven't seen too often. This would be um, from the G.I. Joe Real American Hero Run. This would be Steel Brigade from 1987. Now, Steel Brigade was a really, really cool figure because it was you. You basically sent in all your information, what you wanted for him, the weapon, uh, the kind of class he was, his co like not his code name, his real name and all that stuff, and he became you. Now, the figure you got was just generic and the weapon you got was the same. There are different versions of Steel Brigade, yes. Minor variations, but um, that one you got back just had basic weapons. But that was you, and that was so cool. That was something I never got as a kid, and he's very, very sought after in the Joe community, especially especially if you're a collector of variants. Good luck with that one. Well, it's funny that you went with a mail-away figure because my least holy of holiest uh, is also a mail-away figure. Now, this is a, from a line in the mid-80s, uh, from a line that you and I both love, and I'm specifically talking about the Clark Kent figure from the Superpowers line. Now, nothing special about the way Clark Kent arrived to you. He was just in a, a, a white little box, a mailer, just like Kenner always did, whether it was Bullock from Indiana Jones or whether it was Obi-Wan Kenobi if for Power of the Force 2, but it was Clark Kent. It was a mail-away offer, like I said, on the back of many card backs, and then you could have Clark Kent in his blue suit with glasses, uh, and he was just a figure like everybody else, but it was so cool to have him and seeing him I just wish you know that line would have gone on and on so that we could have got a Bruce Wayne or a Dick Grayson or any of the alternate personalities but uh, to have Clark Kent as an actual figure was kind of unprecedented because we haven't really seen too much of that uh, for releases it's always just been Superman or Superman in a different outfit or Batman or Batman in a different outfit except for one or two Bruce Wayne uh, issues that they've done. Okay, Rob, the next figure on my holy grail list, in true Rob McCallum fashion, isn't a figure at all, but it's a vehicle. This is a line that I had a couple of the figures growing up back in the late 70s and early 80s. Definitely didn't have any of the vehicles. I'm talking, of course, about the 1979 Mego Buck Rogers Starship. This thing is absolutely gorgeous. And we're getting into that category of, like we're talking about going onto eBay and not finding this stuff. This is one I've been searching for for a couple years now. It's never on eBay. Actually, sorry, I think I saw it one time. It's notoriously fragile. It's notoriously missing a lot of the engine parts and the stickers. So that is my number two, would be the Buck Rogers Starship by Mego. I just find anything that is space themed pre 19 83. So anything before Return of the Jedi was released, any space thing is very difficult to find. Yeah. Always has a high price tag and always has that word fragile as if the, 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 the craftsmanship wasn't quite up to par with that stuff and there's pieces that are breaking off. Um, so as soon as you said Buck Rogers, I'm thinking, oh, space, oh, fragile, oh, hard to find, super yeah. expensive, never have the opportunity. It, it certainly falls into grail discussion when you, when you consider all those elements. And it's funny because Mego is a fantastic company, the world of superheroes line. Those, those figures and the vinyl playsets like the Star Trek Enterprise, bridge playset, that stuff is tough as nails. But for whatever reason, that starship, as far as durability, it doesn't hold a candle to like Kenner's X-Wing. Kenner's X-Wing, you could drop it, throw it around. And I've seen many videos with guys with the Buck Rogers Starship where they actually are holding it with gloves because it's light. And if you drop it, it's gonna shatter just like a porcelain glass. Well, getting to number two on my list, Jay, it's funny you brought up Secret Wars because that's something that holds a, a slot for me. And, you know, of course, I gotta go hipster pick. None of the original figures, not Wolverine with the alternate claws, not Black Suit Spider-Man, because those are out there and you can get them. But I'm talking specifically Electro. Now, Electro, along with Constrictor and Iceman, were only released in Europe. Mm. So these are a regional release. But as, a, as an Electro fan specifically, it would have been so cool to have this figure as a kid. 
Now it's, you know, in the four to $500 price range on card when you can find it. It's really hard to find it loose and complete because of the lenticu lenticular hologram shields that they all came with where, you know, you bend them back and forth and you see kind of like the, the face change. You've almost got to get this on card but because it's a regional release, it's so, so hard to get. Well, you know me, Rob, it's time to go big or go home. And my particular figure that I put in the number one spot is one that is not easily obtainable. It's one that has so many legendary stories behind it. It was never released to the public at all. It's from the greatest film franchise of all time. And I, of course, I'm talking about everyone's favorite bounty hunter, the rocket firing Boba Fett. This was one that the story goes something like this. The Mattel Battlestar Galactica figures came out and apparently, you know, a poor little kid got a piece of it lodged in his throat, choked, and Kenner kind of said, you know what, I think that's just a lawsuit waiting to happen. We're going to go back to the drawing board and we're going to take the rocket firing feature out, which is kind of too bad because it was advertised all on our packages as kids. You would send away proofs of purchase and the Boba Fett would come in the mail. And of course the one that came didn't have the rocket firing function. What is great though, is that through reproduction communities and uh, figure custom communities, they've done lots of repros of this figure that you can get both in the painted style on the card art, the little sticker, and the actual style of the prototype. That is my number one. Go big or go home, that's what I say. I wanna to get to my number one slot on, on the holiest of holies, and that, of course, is the Rob McCallum rule, where it's not actually a figure. You broke it before me, so that that's awesome. <laughs> I am talking about a playset. It's kind of more of a diorama playset, but I guess you could say it is a playset, and it comes from Kenner's uh, 82 Indiana Jones line, and that is the Well of Souls. Now, it's, it's not a lot to look at. There isn't a lot going on here, but it has the arc. It, you can ha have all the walls and everything there and the snake pit. It's just, it's just so, so, so rad. It is one of those iconic pieces. I don't think it ever came to Canada. The line has, you know, it didn't sell well. I, I, but every time you try to collect this line, it's astronomically priced. So get in on it now because it's only gonna be worth more to later, uh, you know, and to have something like the Well of Souls on display with some cool vintage, you know, indie figures, hopefully their thumbs aren't broken off as is pretty common. Uh, it would be, it would be pretty rad. So the Well of Souls, just a cool piece from a line that is uh, awesome. Not very big, but pricey. And this actually kills me because right across from me, I'm looking at the arc itself because I used to have the Well of Souls. Now in true Indiana Jones fashion, I had almost the entire line except the mail away Belloc. I'm pretty sure, my friend, that they're around here somewhere, perhaps in the basement of my house. But uh, I'm looking forward to digging because I had it and it's gorgeous. Forget about collecting it today unless your bank account is high. You know, there's so many little snakes. There's the cover for the Ark. The Ark itself is worth hundreds of dollars. Uh, but I agree with you, that is such a holy grail and a fantastic line. All right, that'll do it for another episode of the Jay and Rob Toy Show, our discussion on holy grails. But Jay, I have one last question to fire your way, and that is, how did you feel once you actually acquired a holy grail for yourself? How did it change you? How did it change your collection? And uh, how is it going to change hunting other grails down in the future? My holiest of grails in my collection would be the USS Flag, which is the centerpiece of actually my house. It's in my studio where I, where I do all my shooting and where we shoot this wonderful show. I got that a little while ago and I gotta tell you, it felt, it felt amazing. It was something I wanted as a child. It was something that we all knew that one kid who had it. I got to see it once in person at lunchtime at this kid's house. We saw it on the top shelf of the Toys R Us but it was just way too expensive. Not to mention there was no room in our little bedrooms in our house. It felt fantastic. Uh, I have a bunch of grails on my list as we've been talking, but uh, the flag was definitely a collector's accomplishment.